Please welcome the CEO and president for Booking.com, Glenn Fogel, in discussion with Skift executive editor and founding editor, Dennis Shaw. Hey everybody, Glenn, so nice to have you here in person. And you're actually not just the CEO of Booking.com, you're the CEO of Booking Holdings, Priceline, Kayak, a few other brands out there, Agoda. So this is not some, uh, you know, just a Booking.com CEO. I was, I was wondering about that introduction, actually. We should, <laughs> we should have talked about it. Yeah, he would have told me about it later. Maybe you um, something I didn't. <laughs> oh, God. Um, Oh, if you have any questions for Glenn, please help me out, ask the questions through the app. That would be great. So, um, Glenn, just, just looking back at the whole um, you know, pandemic, the beginnings of the pandemic, you guys had to lay off 25% of your workforce, get funding, whatever. Uh, how do you feel the company made it, navigated the pandemic, and what sorts of lessons have you learned along the way? Well, it's been a very hard time for everybody, let's face it. It's not just our company, it's everybody in the world. It's been really tough. And you look back and you think, gee, what could I have done differently? And what should I now, having learned the things I should have done differently going forward, what should we prepare for, right? And it's interesting because we're all thinking about when is this going to end? And what we're not thinking about is, OK, what happens after that? What's the next thing And being prepared? And it's interesting because we always put in our risk uh, uh, condition, we always talked about the risks in the company in our public documents, we always talked about the potential pandemic. We always had it there. We wrote it. But did we really prepare? We probably didn't. And that's something I think about going forward is how can we prepare ourselves better for the next big crisis? Because there are going to be crises all the time. They never go away. And that's the thing is being agile, being flexible, being able to make changes quickly. How do you make decisions? And I think we did a really good job. They get 27,000 people in a very short time working from home. I mean, if somebody asked me, can we do that before it happened? I would say, no way. And yet we did it. And then going forward, how can we put together things so that our customers can be treated fairly and well in this crisis? How can we help out the industry and do all these things? It's worked out, I think, much better than I would have predicted. Somebody said, you're going to have a pandemic like that. But the fact is, we have to continue to think about how can we make sure we're prepared for anything that happens down the road. And that's the real lesson. Interesting. So one of the big developments during the pandemic was the Airbnb IPO. They had a crazy valuation. At this point, you guys are within shouting distance of their, their valuation. And some of the media would say that, um, and maybe some investors feel like Booking.com, Booking Holdings was taken down a peg. Um, you were clearly king of the hill you know, in the years leading up to the pandemic. How do you view what has taken place? Has it changed anything for you? And I really don't think about it in that way. Okay. And I know, you know, so many people that make this into like some sort of sporting event, who's ahead and who's behind and what your scores are and all that. And I'm saying, how about we just concentrate on providing a really great service for our customers and uh, our customers are both the travelers and our suppliers and make the world better. And that's really where I concentrate. And somebody says, oh, look, Airbnb or this. I'm like, why is that? How, what does that have to do with making somebody happier on their travels? But you're not just a happiness company. You know, you're, you're there to make, make money, and they're a formidable competitor. I mean, you're looking to you know, break into the US in a bigger way in short-term rentals. So to that, you say? <laughs> I say that if you provide a great service, the money will come. Provide a really good service to travelers, and to suppliers, and everything else will, will be fine. In regards to Airbnb, I, I can't tell you how much I admire what they've done. Brian's a great leader, he's done fantastic things. It's really helped a lot of people, and certainly we, we, we benefit too from the fact that more people look also at non-hotel accommodations, because 
we have a heck of a lot of non-hotel accommodations. We got over six million of them. Right. And the fact that I really like about our product is the fact that customers many times don't, they don't know what they want when they come and visit. They're not sure, do I want a hotel or do I want a condo? Do I want a home or do I, what do I want? A little tree house or what do I want? We offer it all. And by enabling this service that enables people to see all the different types of accommodations and be able to compare them, see what the different prices are, see what the different reviews are, and do all these things, I think we really do offer the customer a better way to shop. So Brian was here the other night, and he said, I forget what figure he used, that they were spending like $800 million in marketing annually, and they basically shut it off. I'm sure that's... I'm sure that's an overstatement. Um, and yet they still had 90% of the traffic, something like that. So what do you take from that? I mean, um, you, well, they, they misspent $800 million. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Would you, I don't know. I mean, did they fire the CMO? I, 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 <laughs> wait, they said $800 million. They got nothing for it. <laughs> That wow. is certainly another way to look at it, but they certainly do have um, they certainly do have a great brand in terms of uh, clearly, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> On to other subjects now. I bet they're investors like that. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was announced that that U.S. borders would finally be open up to people from Europe and other yep. countries starting in November. Um, what does that mean for your business? Oh, it's, it's really great, and I'm surprised it took so, so long, but okay, better late than never, as they say, right? I mean, did anybody else find that odd that we wouldn't let in people from places that have a much lower infection rate than ours? I mean, what was the science on that one? Or the fact, or the, I mean, like, I learned, I mean, it's, it's just so weird. It's, we have virus everywhere in parts of our country, and we said, no, don't let those people in, they may bring in the virus. I mean, what is going on? <laughs> Who, who was thinking, like, no, this will help a lot if we don't let people in from Europe? It's like, whatever. It's, look, it's, it's needed for this industry because we need international travel. International travel is so important for so many jobs, so much of this industry. So anything we can do to enable people to travel internationally safely is great for all of us. Right. And I'm really thankful that they finally, finally did it. Great. Um, so in the competition uh, in short-term rentals, you're trying to break into the U.S. You're you're trying to sign up property managers. I think that's your uh, yeah. the basics of your strategy. Um, and Verbo has also been making some gains, right? Mm -hmm. They've been aggressive in trying to woo or steal Airbnb superhosts. Yeah. You know, they have this incentive program. That it's in the U.S., Canada, France, and the U.K. at this point. I don't hear much from Booking.com on this front. I'm sure you have an approach, you, you know, probably not super enthusiastic about publicizing it, but what is your approach to uh, attracting Airbnb super hosts? There's a lot of anger at Airbnb among hosts. How are you dealing with that? So a couple things, I, and, and, and as you said it a couple times of breaking in, you, you said, and I, I just have to, uh, politely correct. Yes. We, we've been in the short-term rental business in the U.S. for a very, very, very long time, right. and we have a big business doing that. Um, we do want to make it bigger, and I've been very open about saying there are some, you know, some areas where we think we're behind some of our competitors. I'm very honest about that, and I want to improve upon it, and that includes getting more hosts, and we've talked about that a lot, about providing them the things that they need to be successful on our platform, changing things and doing those things, which we are doing. Um, and yes, Verbo is doing a whole bunch of incentives so they can have more people on their platform, and that's the nature of competition. And I, and you know, you use the word steal, and I was actually, uh, somebody said that to me, another person used that word steal. Nobody's stealing anything, steal's a bad word. You're trying to create the most competitive environment, and you're going out and you're providing great things so that people come and use your service, and whether that's on the supply side or on the demand side. And we're trying to do the same thing. And we're talking with uh, uh, hosts who have uh, properties. We're talking who are uh, big users of uh, big 
managers of large amounts of properties and talk with them, come up with ways that we can work together to make sure that they're putting their inventory on our platform. Because the truth is, when a bed is empty, that's no revenue, you fill that bed and you know the margin goes straight to the bottom line. So everybody in the world who in this business knows how much how important it is to have occupancy up as high as you can get it. And that means using every single channel you can to make sure that that bed is filled. We are a an opportunity for those people who are not currently using us, and we're trying to make sure that we are doing whatever they feel is necessary to make sure they're comfortable using our platform, and that's what we're doing. I don't publicize it, I agree. We're doing it because one of the things I believe is important when you're trying to be successful is not telling other people what you're doing. Right. Much to our chagrin. Yeah. So Peter Kern of Expedia was here yesterday, and he had some nice things to say about booking holdings, and he also had some sort of trash talky things to say about booking holdings, <laughs> which I welcomed, I mean, honestly. But um, so I just wanted to hit you up with a couple of them, see what you say. So he said, they, meaning booking holdings, are a nearly perfect machine at driving discounts through performance marketing. Nobody's better than them. They didn't waste the 800 million, right? So I admire them greatly, but that doesn't mean it has as much potential because when we get it right, Expedia, our machine will accelerate as we lean into our advantage, advantages. In other words, he said, Expedia has more upside for investors than does Booking Holdings. You've kind of peaked, in other words. They're, they're down there, but you've peaked. Well, if he said it about me personally, I'm sure that's true, actually. <laughs> uh, The makeup artist was looking at like I come into this thing, you know, they put like Yeah, she was probably listening yesterday. No, but she was looking at me like you know a lot of work, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> like, Peter, Peter's a Peter's a great guy. And he's he's done wonderful things already. You look at that stock price again, you know, the race and stuff. The investors are very happy, I'm certain what they've done there is good stuff. And uh, I, I love the fact being in an in industry that has such incredibly talented people all competing to create the best things for the consumers. And that's what we're gonna to continue to do. And I'm very pleased to say that I think we're doing a great job and I look at the results that we're coming up with and what we're providing and some of the great things down the road with our connected trip that I'm really seeing beginning to come together. I just, I just know that the future still has, a, it's incredibly bright for all of us in this industry, notwithstanding I may have peaked. <laughs> So about your connected trip strategy, he said, it's a good set of words, but we've been in the trip business for a long time and we sell more multi-product trips than any, any other OT, OTA in the world. We're gonna keep doing it. And he says, to, when his staffers ask him about the connected trip, your connected trip, he says, it's a trip. <laughs> See, here's the thing. I don't know, how, can we just a show of hands? How many people uh, flew here or you know, took a trip as opposed to me I drove? Okay. Uh, how many of you thought it was absolutely seamless, perfect from the time you actually started planning to the, right now, of course, you're still in the middle. It still could go terribly wrong. But for, <laughs> for, for the people it hasn't yet, <laughs> yeah. how, how do you feel about that? Was this just as easy as everything else you do when you order stuff from Amazon and it just shows up a couple hours later? How most, no, no, many of you there are old, are old enough to remember um, to get like a cab you, in the middle of the rain, you stood outside and you put your finger up and you just prayed to God somebody would come by and get there, right? Now we have Uber and Lyft and all those wonderful things, right? There's so many examples I could give and yet travel, travel, we're still in the stone ages because we're still ticked off as could be and I'm gonna be smart. I was at one of these conferences and I, I, I singled out a supplier, I'm not gonna do it this time, even though it was fun. Uh, <laughs> I can do it this time. My daughter was on a trip this summer and she and her boyfriend, they were getting on a plane from New York to out to the West Coast and she was outside JFK, 15 minutes out driving here and she gets an, a text that the flight is canceled. That's it, not like the flight is canceled and we're gonna rebook you. And by the way, we've taken care of your car rental, which was in this other city, but now we have to do you into this other city, San Francisco instead of San Jose, so we've changed the car rental for you. And you're not gonna get there till much later, but don't worry, we notified the hotel that you're gonna be getting there after midnight, so please don't give the room away. None of that happened. 
all that happened was the text said, it's canceled. My daughter, she called me, Dad, what do I do? And I'm like, did you happen to use our service? <laughs> she booked elsewhere? She booked direct. Oh, my God. It pays to book direct. No. <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> and I said, well, did you call the um, your customer service? She said, yes. They said it'll be eight hours before they get back to me. <laughs> eight hours. Eight hours. I'm like, okay, let me see what I can do. And I was home, of course, so I was online. I dealt with it all. I fixed it all. All fine. That should all happen automatically. That should happen instantly. This data is available. There's no reason that shouldn't have happened the way I can you know, go to my phone and get an Uber, or I can go to Amazon, and it just shows up. And if something's wrong, I don't have to wait eight hours for somebody to call me back. It's bad. That's why when I believe this connected trip, I don't think it's just a bunch of words. I think it's creating something that we all want and desperately need, and it will help make travel a much better experience. And that's what I want to help achieve. We've got a couple of audience questions that look interesting. What type of M&A is left in the online travel sector? What worries you about what type of new tech would disrupt your business? Oh, there's so much out there. It's ridiculous how much is out there right now. There's so many new things coming down the pike. There's so many new types of technology. And, and there's stuff that's much further along that is, in terms of concerning things like quantum computing, which are not much people are following that stuff, could be just incredibly mind-blowing different. But of course, that's still pretty far down the road. But there's a lot of stuff that uh, people are trying to develop. Some of these different services, different things I'm talking about, bring things together. I don't know if you see things. And this is, I say travel, but let's make travel and hospitality. And look at what's happening right now, what happened with uh, Toast, which provides that great service to the restaurant area, right? The reason it's so successful, the reason it's valued so high, the reason everybody's excited about it is because providing something that's very different for the restaurateurs to be able to operate their systems better, and make things work better. Well, think about the hotel business right now. And if anybody here works in a hotel, and you look at all the different services and systems, and they don't talk to each other, and it's just a nightmare. Talk to anybody who works in uh, the back office of a hotel. It's, oh, it's crazy. There's so many. These are all things that can be approved upon. There are lots of people working on that. So again, it's not just what we as consumers see up front. It runs all the way through the stack. And there are places to make improvements everywhere. I, I always tell the story. I booked a, uh, a hotel through Hotel Tonight a couple, really two years ago. Hotel Tonight. Mm. You know them, <laughs> and I'm sure you looked at them. And um, it was a former Starwood ho Hotel, I forget which brand, and uh, the, the front desk guy goes, oh, let me go on the back, I gotta see if the fax came in. So, fax, it's fax. An antique, an antique. Yeah. Uh, another question. You know, question. half the people here don't have no idea what a fax is. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and this hotel has rotary phones in the room, so that's pretty cool. Um, give us a sense, so you, you recently, they do. Um, you recently uh, launched a, a dedicated fintech unit. Yeah. So the question is, give us a sense of the fi financial payments efforts you are doing. What led to the creation of the fintech unit? Well, what, 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 the reason we created it is, again, this area of providing a better service. So uh, for one example, just right away, when you're traveling internationally, there's so much FX that you have to deal with and things that are annoying make it easier. Um, if you are a hotel and you're a smaller hotel and you're you know, taking credit cards, you're getting charged a lot of money. And I'm thinking to myself, well, we have volume. We can do that cheaper. Why don't we help the hotels out? We'll do it. We'll do it for them. And we'll do it in a way that's cheaper than they would do on their own. You'll be processing the credit cards. Well, we can do, we can, why, don't do, why not do something like that? Yeah. And then you come up with things every, I assume, is uh, familiar with how exciting uh, this uh, buy now, pay later uh, type companies are doing right now. Well, that too, I mean, we used to have, remember, well, you may not, you may not be my age. Well, you know, this is back when I was peaking, uh, way back. <laughs> um, you have a thing called uh, Christmas uh, savings uh, thing for your Christmas travel. club. Yes, exactly. So you save money so you have money so you could then travel at some point. Well, now there are a lot more uh, different ways to be able to use credit and stuff. So there's so many things that we can do here. And the idea is create services that are good on both sides of the marketplace and make some money while we're doing it. That's what we're trying to do. And um, are, are some of these things 
taking place now? Does Absolutely. the company go so after for, some of these? Yeah, I'll give you an example. So um, again, we live in the US, so uh, well, not all of us, but some of us do. And it's, it's fairly easy, credit card, it's all fine, not a problem. But let's take the, and I give this example because it's an easy one, you're in China and you do most of your payments, let's say you're using Alipay or WeChat Pay or something like that, and you go traveling in Europe and you go to the small hotel in uh, Switzerland, you think they're gonna take that? They're gonna say, what's that? I don't know how to do that. And they certainly don't wanna spend the time, energy, effort, money to set up all these different, different types of payments. We can do that for them. We'll take that WeChat pay, we'll take the Alipay money, and we'll hand the money over to the hoteliers in the way they wanna get paid. That's the simple example of where we can provide something that removes the cost, takes costs out of this system, and it's good for everybody. So another audience question, a topic I wanted to cover, what is your sense of dependence on Google now, post-pandemic? They've just started a uh, things to do business, yeah. they're doing vacation yeah. rentals now. So, so Google, obviously, we all know, is uh, the giant in the room of many, many different industries, travel included. And obviously, we all read in the papers, there's a lot of look at uh, Google from a regulatory environment. People say, hmm, I don't know about this. Maybe you know they're too big or they're doing too many things. Look, our sense is always just go out and get the customers, wherever they are, and show them such a great service that when they come back, they come back direct. That's where we want to be. I want, of course, to not depend on anybody. I want to do it so that consumers, when they come uh, looking for travel, the first thing in their mind is booking. That's what I want them to do. And the way to do that is give them great value, great service, great customer service. Be what really is supposed to be a travel agent. The meaning of the word agent, you're working in favor of a principal, principal being the customer, that agent-principal relationship. It's our duty to do what's great for them. That's what I want to do. Have you given up on your hotel business, and do you think cities will be ghost towns in the future? God, I'm so tempted to say something. I'm not going to say it because I'm trying to, be, <laughs> trying to hold it in. So nobody knows what the future is going to be, really. Uh, I'm willing to admit that I can make a prediction on that one. That ain't happening. It's not going to be a ghost town. Um, but there's no doubt that everybody wonders, uh, are we going to work from offices or homes, or what's the split going to be? And I look, I get people, and it does seem to go uh, almost demographic. The younger the person is, the more they want to not work in an office, and I want to ask them, well, how are you going to meet anybody? Uh, but, but apparently that's not allowed in offices anymore, so I guess that doesn't matter. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I'm not sure what the future is going to be in that area. I do believe, I, I, think, I think maybe Brian said something about the fact that people are going to take uh, more trips because they're going to be working. Not, I, right. I, I hope he's right. I don't know, but it kind of makes sense. He said almost. there'll be a new golden age of travel. It's certainly possible. Yeah. It's certainly possible. I mean, the fact is we um, all are beginning to reevaluate our lives because of this pandemic. And uh, a lot of people, look, this great uh, quitting, it's called, where people are just leaving and just say, I'm, I don't want to work right now, I'm going to take time off, or uh, I just don't want to go into office and stuff. There's a reevaluation of what's important in life, and how hard do I want to work, and where do I want to work, and there's a lot of that. We don't know what the end's going to be, and that's why what I, when people ask me, do we have to go back to the office? I said, well, we'll start with some rules, and we'll say, this is what we think, but it's an experiment. We'll see what we learn. We'll use the data to figure, is this the best way or not? There are pros and cons, right, we can put on a piece of paper, but until we actually do this, you know, we don't know what the best way is yet. And I'm willing to admit that. I, I, there's so many people I read in the paper and they're emphatic, you know, they're, they're like, absolutely, this is what we're going to do. And I'm like, how do you know? How do, how are you, why are you so certain? I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, uh, Greg O'Hara from Sertaris was here yesterday and he said, you know, we have data to show that in 2023, business travel will be 80% back. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> 80, exactly, 80, exactly, yeah. exactly. He has no Look, data to think the way, it would be any different. Oh, by the way, Greg is an incredibly successful, smart guy, so yeah. don't, don't, bet, <laughs> don't bet against him. <laughs> yeah, so we're out of time, Glenn, so. Uh, well, um, very good meeting, and uh, this is my first time I've been in a meeting in person. I just tell you, it's so great to be back together, and I thank everybody who came here. We're honored. Thank you. Okay.